be I actually study mathematics and cryptography. Uh, so yes, there's definitely something wrong with me. Uh, my slides are licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution uh, Share Alike license. This means that you're more than welcome to take my presentation, modify it to fit your own needs if you like it. Uh, just give me credit. That's much it. Also, you'll find that my slides are pretty boring. I'm not one of these fancy transition Uber image guys. It's plain text. So let's start with random numbers. This is pretty much going to be the overview of my presentation. I'm going to discuss what random numbers are, and then we'll just jump right into the three classifications of random numbers. That's pseudo-random numbers, cryptographically secure pseudo-random numbers, uh, and then true random numbers. And then we'll talk about some randomness tests uh, and wrap up with some afterthoughts. So why do we need random numbers? It turns out we actually use random numbers quite a bit in our daily life. For example, lottery drawings. Uh, although illegal in the state of Utah. Oh, I'm running out of power. Um, So anyway, with lotteries, uh, lottery drawings like Powerball, for example, require heavily on randomness. We want these, uh, these drawn numbers to be as random as possible. In fact, generic gambling, Las Vegas and Atlantic City, make a great deal of money, the casinos, by you playing against the odds that randomness produces. We also apply it very much in a uh, physical world, such as weather modeling, thermodynamics, quantum mechanics, uh, randomness fits uh, in quite a bit of actual physical uh, sciences. We use it for pattern recognition, game theory. Before the presentation, I was showing somebody here uh, a physical contraption called the Dysomatic. If you have not seen the Dysomatic, do a YouTube search for it. This guy runs a uh, runs gamesbyemail.com and he was using a random number generator for his dice throws. And uh, people were getting upset that these dice throws didn't seem random enough. Uh, and so he ended up creating this intense hardware and software application that does manual dice throws. And he says that if, the die, if you're not happy with the results, he'll melt that dice down, email it to you, and let that be a lesson to the other dice. So. Uh, but in game theory, card shuffling, dice rolls, you know, online games like Hearthstone or World of Warcraft rely heavily on, on randomness. Monte Carlo simulations are a way to approximate numerical values using random numbers. And then finally, of course, random numbers are the workhorse behind cryptography. Uh, we need uh, random numbers to create unpredictable keys. Uh, these are used for encrypting your sessions, your TLS, and your GPG, and uh, also your other, your, encrypt, your encryption. So let's define randomness properly. Randomness is the lack of pattern or predictability of events without, a, without order. And otherwise, individual events are unpredictable. We can't predict what the next event will be like. For example, if we're randomly picking numbers between one and a million, uh, we should not be able to predict what the next number is that will be drawn. However, when we generate large amounts of random numbers, we can start to make some predictions about some certain behaviors. Monte Carlo simulations fit well here. For example, if I were to pull 100,000 random numbers from one to a million, I could say with confidence that about one out of every 10 numbers is picked. Certainly if I plotted it on the number line, I could see uh, that ratio. So I can begin to make some assumptions about what I'm doing with my randomness. It's important to separate randomness from chaos theory. Though. Chaos theory is the study of a, dyna a dynamical system where initial conditions will determine the outcome, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean we can predict the outcome but we can make some early predictions in the short term. Uh, for example, population growth and decay is a chaotic system. We can make some immediate 
predictions about the or about the population growth given the environment uh, and threats. But as we increase time to great orders, it becomes more difficult to make these sorts of predictions. With randomness, though, I can't predict the next event. Where with chaos theory, I can do that with some degree of accuracy. So that's really the separation between the two. Here is an animated GIF showing a Monte Carlo simulation of approximating the numerical value of pi. We have the unit circle inscribed inside of a unit square, and then we are generating random xy coordinates and plotting that coordinate in the, in the unit square. We take the ratio of the coordinates inside of the unit circle to the coordinates outside of the unit circle. As we populate more and more coordinates, that ratio approaches pi. Right. All right, so now we've defined randomness. Let's look into our three main classifications of random numbers. First, pseudo-random numbers. Pseudo-random number generators have four properties that we'd like to have. They must first off start with a seed. A pseudo-random number generator is an algorithm, a mathematical algorithm, and we need something to kickstart it. Many of you are probably thinking in your head, uh, but I know not to start my pseudo-random number, number generator with time. I know not to use time as a seed. That's actually a really bad myth. It's a, it's a false uh, statement. And if you'd like to discuss that with me after, I'd be more than willing. But pseudo-random number generators are just here to provide randomness. If you need security out of your random number generators, then we can talk about cryptographically secure, which we'll do in a second, and then we might have a, uh, an, an actual discussion regarding that specific initial seed. Random number generators, also we want them to be uniformly distributed. This means that each number is likely, likely to be output as any other. There's no favoritism or what we call bias towards one number or another. All of the outputs are equally likely to be generated. We want our pseudo-random number generators to have a large period. A random number generator is creating a sequence of random numbers. Uh, earlier, a friend of mine, just like 10 minutes ago, said, what's random about the number 88? Well, there's nothing inherently random about any individual number. When we're talking about random numbers, we're talking about a sequence, two or more. We can make actual uh, assumptions about randomness when we look at a sequence, but an individual number itself, seven, is that random? I, sure, why not? What about seven, seven, or seven, seven, seven? Then we can start to make an assumption about uh, the generator. So a large period is creating a sequence of repetition-free numbers. As soon as that sequence is regenerated, we found the size of our period. We want that period to be as large as possible. And of course, finally, there should be no reason why I should have to wait around for my random number. When I request one, I should be able to get one quickly. So how do we create a pseudo-random number generator? Here are three methods that you could do with a pencil and paper. In fact, if you want to impress your family and friends at Thanksgiving next month, uh, Here's some things you could do. Three generators, the middle square method, the linear congruential generator, and the lagged Fibonacci generator. Let's look at each of these. The middle square method begins with an n-digit seed. We square that to get a 2n-digit number, zero padding as necessary. And then we take the middle n digits and use that as the next seed, and we continue the process. So for an example, here's me taking a four-digit number, 4739. I square it to get 22458121. I take the middle four digits as my next seed, square it, take the middle four digits, square it, so forth. My generated sequence comes out as 4851, 9855, 1210, etc. So this is the middle square method. Some observations with the middle square method. Unfortunately, it has a very small period. Uh, in fact, when this generator fails, it fails spectacularly. And it does so by usually converging to zero. This is the common case with the middle square method. Obviously, zero squared is zero. You're not going to get past that number in your generator. 
A less common scenario is converging to a number other than zero. Say, for example, 50. 50 squared is 2,500. The middle numbers of 2,500 are 50. So we'll get stuck on 50. The same for 10 and some others. These two failures make up the bulk of the failures for the middle square length of the row. However, it is possible that we can have a repeating cycle. Uh, and this is the least common scenario of a failure for the middle squared method, where I'll generate maybe 10 or 11 random numbers, and then I will cycle back uh, only th like the previous three. Well, so I'll get stuck on three numbers in my cycle. So my cycle length would only be three random numbers. So it turns out this isn't a very good pseudorandom number generator. We want to do something better. So let's look at the linear congruential generator. This sounds fancy, but this is really nothing more than what you learned in junior high. This is just y equals ax plus b. That's all it is. Except we're putting a modulus on it to bound it, because the numbers are going to continue to grow. So we'll put an upper bound on it to keep it from uh, going out of hand. So we're going to take a seed x0, a scalar a, a constant b, and then, of course, a modulus n. So the generator is defined as x sub n plus 1 equals a times x sub n plus b mod m. And then we let x sub n equal x sub n plus 1. So our new seed was our previous output. As an example, let's set our seed to 7, our scalar to 1, our constant 7, and we'll do this in mod 10. So our first round, 1 times 7, there's our seed, plus 7, our scalar, mod 10 equals 4. That becomes our new seed for x sub 2. So 1 times 4 plus 7 is 11. 11 mod 10 is 1. That becomes our new seed and so forth, right? It's as simple as y equals ax plus b mod n. That's all we're doing here. So our generated sequence comes 418529 four, cents, et cetera. Some observations. The period is at most the size of the modulus. In our case, we were modulus 10. Uh, our period length is going to be at best 10 numbers. Uh, and for some choices of our scalar, it could actually be much less. We do like the linear congruential generator because it's fast and requires minimal memory to retain state. But this third bullet point is basically saying it's highly predictable. Uh, it will lie in at most n factorial times n raised to the 1 over n power hyperplanes in n dimensional space. Not expecting you to understand that. The takeaway is it's predictable. Uh, if we wanted to maximize our period length, we wanted it to be the size of m, then we have some requirements. m and the offset or the, uh, the constant b must be relatively prime. That means they share no factors. a minus 1 must be divisible by all the prime factors of m. And a minus 1 is divisible by 4 if m is divisible. If these requirements are met, you will maximize your, your period. Now my personal favorite, the lagged Fibonacci generator. The lagged Fibonacci generator comes from the Fibonacci sequence, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. S sub n equals S sub n minus 1 plus S sub n minus 2. Right? Basically, we're taking a two-element array. We add those two elements in the array, append the result to the array, and pop the first element off and then we re-add the new two elements. In this case, we're going to uh, genericize those two elements. Instead of hard coding the, the array to a two element array, why don't we make a larger array? And let's choose the elements in the array that we're, are going to be doing our summations. So we call these the taps. So J and K will be our two taps. And also we're going to do a modulus. We're going to put an upper bound on it to keep it inside of a confined space. If you want to generate odd and even numbers, then you will need at least one odd and even number that comes through the taps. If your seed is entirely even numbers, then you're going to generate entirely even pseudorandom numbers. That makes sense. So you'll, if you want odd and even, you'll need to at least have one uh, odd number. All right, so here is our form, s sub n equals s sub n minus j plus s sub n minus k, instead of minus 1 or minus 2, mod m, where 0 is less than j is less than k. 
You don't have to have two taps also. You can have three taps and four taps, and this has been studied. Uh, there's some interesting properties with it. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, but know that it has been looked into, uh, and mathematicians like when they're bored doing this sort of stuff. So let's start with a seven-digit array, a C. We'll use uh, a famous number, 8675309, which, by the way, as a side note, if you ever use fresh values cards or value membership cards and they allow you to input a phone number to identify your account, 8675309 with different area codes works really well. So just as an FYI. So let's go ahead and choose our two taps, j equals 3, k equals 7. So the third element in the array and the seventh element in the array, mod 10. So our third element is going to be 7 in that phone number. The seventh element is 9. Add them mod 10 equals 6. We'll append 6 to the array, pop off the first element, which is 8. So now our third element becomes 5, the seventh element becomes 6, and we repeat the process. To show this a little bit more clearly, I've put the third and seventh elements in brackets so we can see as we're moving through the generator what's getting added. Right? So there on S sub 1 is the phone number 8675309. The third and seventh elements, 7 plus 9 mod 10 is 6. 6 gets appended, 8 gets uh, popped off, so we're left with 6, 7, 5, 3, 0, 9, 6. 5 plus 6 mod 10 is 1, 1 gets appended, 6 gets popped off, and we continue the process. Right? After uh, S, sub 7, S sub 7, when we start with the 8th random number, our phone number is no longer part of the, uh, right, no longer part of the array. Some observations with the lag Fibonacci generator. It has a decent period. Uh, that is the size of the period. In our case, k was 7, m was 10. So 2 to the 7th is 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. Uh, so 128 minus 1 is 127. Uh, 2 to the 9th would be 512, right? So our, the size of our period, the maximum length, would be 127 times 512 in this uh, specific case. However, in order to maximize that, we have to make sure that this second bullet point is met. y equals x to the k plus x to the j plus 1 must be primitive over integers mod 2. If you've taken abstract algebra or graduate level mathematics, this will make sense to you. If you haven't, trust the mathematicians. Um, this means, though, that initializing the lag Fibonacci generators is highly complex. This is well studied. For those of you who are familiar with Donald Knuth, Knuth, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name. He wrote the art of computer programming. Uh, he has done research in this area and has a number of values for your modulus and your taps to maximize the, the period length. Uh, two tap generators can fail what's called the birthday spacings test. This is just a test for randomness. Uh, but research has been done in this that show that three and four tap and other tap generators don't fail this. So if this is something you're interested uh, in deploying, if you're a developer, um, you might want to keep that in mind. Also, you're not stuck with addition. You can use subtraction, multiplication, or the exclusive or. Uh, and these will change the maximum size of your period. Uh, that, that becomes a little different, but uh, roughly the same. Some other pseudorandom number generators, you've probably heard of Merzing Twister. This is by far the most popular pseudorandom number generator. It's the default random number generator in Python. I believe it's the case with PHP, maybe, and C, and some others. So uh, we like Merzing Twister because it's fast, uh, but it's not something you need to do on a pencil or a paper. There's others like the linear feedback shift register, multiply with carry, uh, and a number of others. All right, let's move to cryptographically secure pseudorandom number generators. Cryptographically secure generators have the same four properties that we saw earlier. We start with an initial seed. They need to be uniformly distributed. We want a large period, and they should be generated quickly. But we're going to add two more requirements to make them cryptographically secure. The first is they must satisfy the next bit test. 
What this means is the generator could generate terabytes or exabytes, could generate a whole mass of data. And regardless of how much data you have, you cannot predict the next bit with any better accuracy than 50%. Either it's a zero or one, and no amount of data beforehand will give you any inclination as to what that bit's going to be. Merzine Twister, for example, fails in this regard. The second requirement we have is it must withstand what we call state compromise extensions. That means if the state of the generator is either partially or wholly compromised, uh, we should not be able to determine the previously generated numbers from the generator. Okay? So we know the current state, but that doesn't tell anything uh, about the past state. It doesn't reveal anything about the past. Further, if this generator is constantly being reseeded, then it won't tell us anything about the future state either because of the next bit test. Does that make sense? So these are the two requirements we need for a cryptographically secure pseudorandom number generator. Can we build one? Yes, we can. First off, your generator absolutely must be nonlinear. If you are designing your own algorithm for a generator and you're using a linear mathematical function, Already, it will not be cryptographically secure. Just by the nature of being linear, we'll be able to predict the next bit. So it'll fail the next bit test. So it needs to be nonlinear. But to help us building it, we can use existing cryptographic primitives. These are things like block ciphers, stream ciphers, or hashing functions. Or if we want to design something from scratch, then we can address the discrete logarithm problem or the quadratic residuosity problem. These are problems that are easy to compute going forward, but difficult to reverse. The discrete logarithm problem says, uh, I'm going to take a root and raise it to a power some mod prime modulus. Okay? If that prime modulus and those root and that number, that root, are primitive roots, then I will get an even distribution through all numbers of the modulus before I repeat. They'll all be accounted for. What's interesting is if that prime modulus is exceptionally large, taking the logarithm of that prime modulus so I can discover x becomes very difficult. This is known as a discrete logarithm problem. The quadratic residuosity problem is just a fancy way for saying it's hard to factor numbers. If I take two prime numbers and multiply them together, I get a composite. If that composite is small, then it's not very difficult for my computer to discover those prime factors. But if that number is large, then it becomes impractical. I don't have enough computing power and enough time to discover what those prime factors are. So if you can guarantee these two uh, computing results, the discrete logarithm problem or the quadratic residuosity problem, you'll have a uh, cryptographically secure generator. For example, here's one called Blum Blum Shub. This is named after the last names of the authors of the generator. This is one you could do on a pencil with a pencil and paper. Uh, this addresses the quadratic residuosity problem. In other words, we're trying to discover the factors, the prime factors P and Q from our modulus. All we require is a seed, X naught, and then a modulus, which is the product of two primes, P and Q. Unfortunately, setting up Blum Blum Shub was kind of intense. The primes must be congruent to 3 mod 4. That means that P mod 4 is 3 and Q mod 4 is 3. Okay. The greatest common divisor of Euler's totient function of P minus 1 and Euler's totient function of Q minus 1 should be small. The smaller that value is, the larger the cycle length of this generator will be. Finally, X naught, our seed, must be co-prime with M. That means that P and Q are not factors of X naught. With all that set aside, the generator is X of M plus 1 equals X of M squared mod M. And then we let X of M equals X of M plus 1. So a very simple generator. Here's an example. We'll set P equal 11, Q equal 19, and our C equal 3. This meets all of the previous requirements that I just set on the other the other side. So I'll have a large generator here. And then we just go ahead and square the seed, mod 209, which is the product of 11 and 19. We get 9. 9 squared mod 209 is 81. 80, 81 squared mod 209 is 82. 
and so on and so forth working through that generator. And we get the following sequence on the bottom. We like this generator because it guarantees that if M is sufficiently large, under 28 bits, for example, finding those prime factors P and Q is not practical. We won't be able to find it with practical hardware or practical power. However, Blum Blum Shove is highly inefficient. It's slow. It turns out taking the square of a number, a really large under 28-bit number, is computationally intensive. So this is not a fast generator. But it does have that security guarantee, uh, provided that our modulus at least is sufficiently large. And I say here at least 80 bits. Uh, 80 bits gives us enough security margin, probably not enough for most people, but enough that at least it gets outside of that realm of being practically possible. Oops, wrong way. Let's look at some other ways we can generate cryptographically secure pseudorandom numbers. We can use an existing cryptographic primitive in what we call counter mode. So our cryptographic primitive could be a block cipher like AES, it could be a stream cipher like ChaCha20, or it could be a cryptographic hashing function like SHA-256. And the idea is that we're going to take a counter, say zero, and we're going to encrypt it with AES, get a result, and then increment the counter by one, and encrypt it, and then increment it by one, and continue in that manner. Or take the hash, the SHA-256 hash, or encrypt it with SHA-20, et cetera. So this means that we're going to require a key. This key is the secret. If this key is known, then all security in the generator is compromised. This is where you would not want to use your time as the key, right? If the time can be discovered, we can compromise the generator. So you'll want this key to be complex. You want it to have sufficient entropy. Again, I mentioned at least 80 bits of entropy. And then we'll have a secure generator. So here's an example. I'm going to use AES 128-bit in ECB mode. For those of you who are familiar with uh, cryptographic primitives and block cipher modes, you're probably seeing a bunch of red flags right now. Wait, what? You're using ECB mode? That isn't secure, dude. I agree. But with AES in 128-bit mode, if I create a 128-bit counter, then I'm only going to be encrypting one block. For ECB mode, this fits fine because I don't have a second or a third or a fourth block to encrypt. So I don't have any structure that I'm going to reveal as part of the process. I'm just encrypting one block of data. I encrypt it, and it's a completely brand new, different block. So ECB mode works well here because we don't have an initialization vector overhead. We don't have a counter overhead like with CTR mode. Uh, we can just go ahead and encrypt the block directly. So I'm going to create 128 bits of zeros. There's my key right there, the N, 5, K, Z, et cetera. And then we go ahead and just encrypt it. I encrypt zero with AES128 with that key, and there's the result in base64. Then I, encrypt, I increment my counter. It's now one. Encrypt it. There's the result. In increment the counter, encrypt, and so forth. This is perfectly valid as a cryptographically secure pseudorandom number generator. Some observations. The generator is only secure as the primitive that you used. If you're using a uh, primitive, say like NES, the data encryption standard, or MD5, or RC4, uh, then your generator, your random number generator, is going to have the same uh, security weaknesses that the primitive has. So you want to choose modern, secure, well-analyzed primitives. Also, the private key needs to remain private but it also must have sufficient entropy. The key needs to be unpredictable. The unpredictable nature of the key is what makes the generator itself unpredictable. As soon as the key can be discovered or figured out, the generator is compromised. Okay? Further, because these cryptographic primitives are usually operating binary mode, they'll probably output uh, binary blobs to your screen, so you probably will need to do some encoding, and that may add some overhead to the overall key. Let's look at another generator. This is a standardized generator by ANSI. It's uh, defined in ANSI X9.17. And uh, it's initially defined by using 64-bit triple DES. This has since been superseded by ANSI X9.34 or 32. 
no, we'll get to it. I believe it's 32, where it, def where it defines 128-bit AES, like I just talked about. Uh, but the, the generator works in this way. We're going to create an n-bit seed S, and then, of course, have my private key. And then for all the numbers that I want to generate, for each time in this loop, I'm going to get a current precision timestamp, okay? down to the picosecond, if possible. I'm going to encrypt that timestamp with my primitive to create a temporary value. The next step is to exclusive or the seed with that temp value and encrypt the result. That's what gets output as my random number. But then I reseed or regenerate a new seed. And I do that by XORing my output, my just recently found random number, with my temporary result earlier. Uh, and that becomes my new seed. And then I go back through the while loop, generate a new timestamp, get a new temp value, so forth. Here is ANSI X9.17 in Python. Uh, ignore the fact that I am importing some modules and setting up some environment variables and functions in advance, but this is the structure of the generator. Right? For i in the range of the numbers I want, five numbers, 10 numbers, I get the current date, I create that temp variable by encrypting the date, then I go ahead and get an output by encrypting the exclusive or of my seed and my temp, and then I reseed by exclusive boring the output and the temp, and then print out the output and go again. Right? I wrote a Python script to do this, uh, added some switches, so I want to generate five numbers with dash n. Here's my key, here's my seed with dash k and dash s. Make sure you can see that all right. And then I just went ahead and execute, and there were my five encoded in decimal. There are my five random numbers. Some observations. X9.17 was defined with triple DOS. So, like I mentioned earlier, it was superseded in X9.31. This is a standard that describes financial documents and financial standards. And inside of the document is where you'll find this, this generator. Also, it's only as secure as the primitive that you use. Again, DES, MD5, RC4 might not be wise choices for uh, this generator. And again, the private key needs to have sufficient entropy. But one interesting side effect is if you are using this on your system, an adversary could set your clock and manipulate the output of the generator. There's been some, including myself until just recently, there's been some outcry to switch the cryptographically secure random number generator in the Linux kernel with ANSI X9.17. I suspect that the kernel developers are not going this route because of the ability to manipulate the clock. So that poses an interesting, an interesting problem. Yeah, question. So the question was, would an NTP service running on the host be sufficient to make sure that we can't modify the time? I'm assuming that's the question. Yeah, so is NTP precise enough? So NTP is just making sure that your clock is staying in sync, right, with the source, but you're putting some trust in the upstream source. Uh, so it's wise to obviously use more than one source, use many sources. Um, but there's no guarantee that those those sources aren't being manipulated. But also, even though the clock NTP might be syncing the clock, an adversary local on the box still could manipulate the time. So while using NTP is certainly wise, it doesn't mitigate the problem of an adversary. Yeah, and there, yeah, the adversary would need, most likely, privileged access on the machine, and you've got other concerns in your random number generator. Yeah, I would definitely recommend, <laughs> yeah, keep, keep NTP running. Uh, here's some other cryptographically secure random number generators. Uh, Blum Blum Shub addressed the quadratic residuosity problem. Blum McCallie is another one 
that you could do by hand that addresses the discrete logarithm problem. Uh, some others, like Isaac, the inverse congruential generator. Rule 30 is uh, by Stephen Wolfram of Mathematica and Wolfram Alphapane. Turns out the guy is not only a good businessman, but he's a sharp mathematician and computer scientist as well. Uh, he developed Rule 30 as a random number generator where it looks at the chaotic nature of cellular automaton. Uh, there's an article on it, and there is some controversy as to whether or not it's actually cryptographically secure. But nonetheless, I think it's interesting for discussion. I wrote uh, as a this, as a uh, learning exercise for myself to learn new programming languages, I decided to write cryptographically secure pseudorandom number generators in, so far, Node, uh, Ruby, and Python. Eventually, I'll get to C and uh, Perl and some other guys. But um, that short link right there takes you to my GitHub project where I've generated, uh, wrote some, uh, some of this code so you can run this in user space. All right, enough with pseudo-random number generators. Let's get into true random numbers. True random numbers have a completely different set of requirements than their pseudo-random counterparts. First off, true random number generators must be unbiased. Unfortunately, I do not know of a single hardware random number generator that is unbiased. They are all biased. So this means that you're going to need to do what's called whitening. You're going to need to unbias the generator. Further, in my professional and personal opinion, hardware random number generators, the hardware should be verifiable as well as the software, as well as the firmware. If you can't verify that the generator is doing what it's claimed to be doing, then how do you know it's not backdoored? I know that's a tinfoil hat question, and I'm not accusing the NSA of backdooring your USB hardware random number generator, but if you can't verify the hardware and you can't verify the software, you're putting a lot of trust in someone who's making some claims that might be sweeping other things under the rug. Certainly if you're going to be using this for long-term cryptographic keys or things that are going to secure your mission-critical environment. If I were you, I'd recommend getting stuff that you can verify. Also, the physical phenomena that is they're using for the generation process should probably also be verified. Um, it's really easy to say, yeah, this would be a good source for random numbers, and then it turns out after some discussion that it's not. Uh, thankfully, we have a decent set that we can choose from. We have already have some established standards, uh, but you'll want to make sure that it's followed in those. And of course, we should have fast generation. There's two types, really, two classifications of true random number generation. There's quantum and non-quantum. Quantum random number generation uses things uh, that discuss the quantum state of matter. So we're going to look at the quantum level. Things like nuclear decay. We could get a guided counter on a nuclear source, say the, uh, the nuclear source in your smoke detector, and we could time when we are catching particles that are decaying off of the, off of the source. Photons traveling through a semi-transparent mirror. Uh, shot noise or mechanical noise in electronic circuits. Amplification of reverse bias, reversed bias transistors. In other words, timing electrons that are jumping across uh, an anode and a cathode that they probably shouldn't be traveling in that direction to begin with. So we're taking electronics to near breakdown as a source. Non-quantum uh, true random number generators use things that are not in a quantum level. Things like thermal noise in a resistor. A resistor steps down voltages, right? And as a result, that step down gets lost in heat. That energy is lost in heat. You can measure uh, the heat fluctuations on a resistor. Diode avalanche noise, atmospheric noise, lightning strikes, car engines, uh, so on and so forth. If you have an antenna, great source for random numbers. Clock drift, not even clock drift, but hard drive timings, hard drive I.O., network I.O., human interaction even. Humans aren't very random when they think about it, but they are random in their physical interactions with the world. For example, the timings between your typing uh, actually turn out to be a decent source of randomness. Where you're moving the mouse on a web page or on a, a graphical application uh, also have some, some entropy behind them and can be a good source of randomness. 
As I mentioned earlier, true random number generators are almost always biased. In fact, not almost, they are. They just are biased. So they need to be whitened. Uh, we have some debiasing methods. I'm going to talk about a couple here in a second. But statistical tests on the quality of the random numbers should always be run, and it should always be monitored. Because we're using hardware for the random number generator, hardware degrades over time, right? It just breaks down. As hardware is degrading, the quality of your random number generator is going to degrade. So you should be monitoring the quality of the random that's coming out of the generator. Uh, and of course, you should be monitoring that the hardware is operating correctly. What's unfortunate with random number generators is they break silently, meaning that it's not easily detectable that you're not getting good quality random number generators unless you're running those statistical tests. Further, they may be influenced by outside uh, interference. I have a, a list, or not a list, a whole bag full of hardware random number generators. One of these guys, uh, this one right here, is an open hardware, open firmware by um, Paul Campbell in, I believe, New Zealand. This is called the One Ring, which I just think is fantastic, the One RNG. This uh, uses uh, shot noise for one source of randomness, but it also has a 2.4 gigahertz wireless antenna that passively listens to the 2.4 gigahertz range right, as a source of randomness. If I know that this is being used in an infrastructure and I'm close to the generator, close enough that I can manipulate the airwaves, I can manipulate the output of this generator. So while atmospheric noise, radios, are, can be a good source of randomness, it can also be interfered with. So keep that in mind. So let's look at some debiasing methods. One common way is the John von Neumann debiasing. This looks at two consecutive bits in the generator. If they're identical, we discard them. If they are not identical, then if they're 1, 0, we output a 1. If they're 0, 1, we output a 0. This means that we're going to lose at least half the bits of the generator. So if we can produce 300 kilobits per second of random data, we're going to at best have 150 kilobits per second uh, coming out of after the, uh, the devising. This will guarantee an unbiased output, but this will not guarantee random output. Case in point, let's say we uh, go ahead and discard all of our, our zeros and ones, and we're left with the output 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. While technically we debiased the generator, we produced very predictable, a very predictable stream of data. Right? Uh, so there's, there's that problem as well. Another way to do debiasing or whitening of the random number generator is to send it through a cryptographic primitive, like AES, SHA-256, SHA-20, SHA etc. In this method, the data from the hardware, the, the output from the true random number generator, becomes the seed for the cryptographic primitive. So the output of the cryptographic primitive is still theoretically truly randomized. However, provided that we have the necessary security margin, margins from the cryptographic primitive, we can guarantee that we have an unbiased output and that we have the generator. Further, we're not going to lose as many bits. Uh, I could take, say, 256 bits of true random data, hash it with SHA-256, and output 256 bits as a result. Now, there is going to be some overhead. I might lose 10, bit, 10 bits of randomness in the process, but I'm losing a lot less than I am with uh, John von Neumann devising. Uh, here are, I don't know if you can see that very well, here is a table of some USB true random number generators, if you're interested. If you do a Wikipedia search for comparison of hardware random number generators, I actively contribute to that table. Uh, this list is pulled from that table. I sorted this by value, which is throughput per dollar, per price. Okay? Uh, obviously, the Intel uh, Ivy Bridge processors and later that have RD RAND on die uh, will get you the most value for your money. They're expensive, but you can get 10 megabits per dollar 
uh, spent out of your generator. Unfortunately, the hardware is closed, and there's no guarantee that uh, there isn't any malicious hardware intent with the Ivy Bridge related or later processors. You could, if you're familiar with Realtek, it's a typo, uh, the Realtek SDR dong dongles, the software defined radio. I don't know if anyone has, is into software defined radio. You can use those with an open source project as a source of randomness. Uh, those will give you about 119 kilobits per dollar, per second per dollar, uh, as a hardware randomly generator. Usually, though, the hardware is closed, which is unfortunate, but at least the software is open source. There's some additional ones there. Kydekin, I have most of these uh, here if you want to see them and talk to me afterwards in my little baggie. Like I mentioned, the One Ring, One RNG, uh, is open hardware, open software, um, and it's a good generator, although a slow one for, for the price. All right, let's talk about some randomness tests. I've only got a few minutes left, which is good. We're coming up on the close of the discussion. Randomness tests are a way to analyze any patterns and run some uh, statistical tests on those patterns to see if they meet some criteria that we know about. This is used to judge the quality of the generator. There's a few tests out there. There's what's called the die-hard tests. This has a battery of tests that you can run, like the birthday spacings uh, and some other things. There's the NIST standardized FIPS 140-2 tests. And then there's also a user space utility that will do some entropy estimation to determine if you're maximizing the entropy of, uh, if it's maximizing the entropy from the generator. Here's the die-hard tests. I'm not going to cover these, just list them and mention them. The birthday spacings, the monkey tests, you know, the parking lot test, so forth. When I am running die-hard, there's a die harder uh, user space utility that you can use. I'll go ahead and use one of my hardware generators, right, one of these guys. I'll generate a file of, say, a megabyte or 10 megabytes, whatever size, and then I'll run die harder on that file. In this case, I called it uh, entropy.bin. And we'll see if it passes the test. So dash D0 will be running this birthday spacings test, dash D10, the parking lot test. If I wanted to do all of the tests that DieHarder supports, I could just pass dash A. With dash A, though, it takes time, considerable time. On a 500 kilobyte file, you're looking at dozens of minutes. So uh, let it run, set aside, and see what passes and what fails. The FIPS 140-2 tests have a different set of tests that they use in judging the quality of the generator. And here's an example of FIPS 140-2, there's a user space utility called RNG test. It only strictly uses the uh, FIPS 140-2 tests, and we can see what passes and what fails. In this case, it was a small file. We can see that it was roughly, what, three and a half megabytes. Uh, it ran 172 tests, got 172 successes, zero failures. And then it showed the throughput uh, towards the bottom. Finally, entropy estimation, there's this utility called ENT. ENT can run further tests. It can run a um, optimum compression to see how well it compresses. Random data, as we know, does not compress very well. Uh, so we should not be able to compress the file. Uh, we can look at the chi-square distribution, the arithmetic mean, even the Monte, Car uh, Monte Carlo simulation for approximating pi. So I've run ENT on, a, on that same file. And it tells me that I'm getting roughly 7.999566 bits per byte. The maximum would be 8 bits. So I can, at least from an entropy perspective, know that this generator is producing good output. And then we can see how well it could compress the chi-square distribution. Uh, looks like the Monte Carlo value for pi was 3.15, 212, et cetera. So about a 0.34% error. All right. Lastly, before I finish up, the Linux random number generator. The Linux random number generator is cryptographically secure, and there are two ways you can read from that generator. You can read from dev random, or you can read from dev u random. Both of them come from the same cryptographic, cryptographically secure pseudorandom number generator, which uses SHA-1. The only difference is dev random will block 
when the system thinks that the entropy of the state of the system is low, where dev u random will not. It'll just give you the, the output of the SHA-1 generation on the generator. If I could tell you anything, if you take anything away from this, it's when dev u random is available, use it. There is really no practical reason to use dev random at all. Unless you are using some theoretical security model where you're looking into some analysis of some primitive, and you would know when you are, then dev random might be appropriate. In every other case, use dev u random. If you don't believe me, there's a link there that is from cryptographer Thomas Tasik of uh, uh, Canada. Uh, and he will go into a much more lengthy discussion on why you should be using Debian Random and to stop using Debian Random. So in conclusion, there are three main classifications of random numbers. We have pseudo-random number generators, cryptographically secure, and then true random number generators, each with their own little advantages and disadvantages. We should always be running randomness tests on our generator, and whenever in doubt, use Debian Random. That's all I have. Are there any comments, questions, or rude remarks? Yes? So the question is, as a developer, what advantages do I have in developing my own generator versus one already provided by the language? Not much. If DevU Random is available, you should be using that. Always. If DevU random is not available, then you can fall back on your language's generator provided it meets the need you're looking for. If you need cryptographically secure and you know the random number generator provided by the language is not, uh, and DevU random is not available, maybe you're working on some firmware for a badge, um, then go ahead and code up ANSI X9.17 with AES. It should fit really in tight spaces and you'll have at least a cryptographically secure user space generator. Any other questions? In the back. Um, I need to email them. Email me, there's my email address, and I'll send them to you. They're an HTML file, so. Any other questions? All right, thanks guys.